All right, well, I have more um, wonderful um, information to share. So back, I think in November, I heard Dr. Uh, Elizabeth Badley speak um, when she was speaking to the RCAT group um, from San Francisco. And I was absolutely blown away because I love Rotary and I love my children. And so hence I'm here uh, talking about the climate. And I was blown away with all the Rotary work that's already happening all around the world. And it inspired me. And I, I really believe that Rotarians are, are quite well poised to be the, the global leaders on this front. So with no further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Elizabeth Bagley from Project Drawdown. Hi everybody, it is such a pleasure to be with you this evening. Um, I recently relocated from the Bay Area where I was uh, living in the East Bay. So I'm familiar with, uh, with all of your stomping grounds and I now live, um, we, we kind of transported and transplanted ourselves in Sitka, Alaska. So a um, oh little bit of a difference, but it's only, it's 39 today, it's pretty balmy. It's not too cold, no snow down here. The snow is still up at 2000 feet. So we can get to it if we feel like hiking, but um, buckle up for that atmospheric river. I was just reading the Chronicle today and uh, I saw what's coming your way. So um, anyway, it is so good to be with you. I'm going to um, share some slides and some stories with you this evening and feel free um, to pop, um, pop questions in the chat and I, I will, um, I will answer them uh, at the end. I might even be able to answer them during if I uh, if I have a if I'm with it enough. So um, can everybody see my slides? Okay. Yep. Great. All right. So you are seeing um, a view from beautiful beautiful Sitka. Excuse me. Um, and uh, I'm just want to do a, a land acknowledgement of, of the gratitude that I have for the Clinket uh, people who have been here and stewarded the land and water since time immemorial. And I've been starting my talks with this question and I would love to invite you to the chat box to answer this question for yourselves tonight. What comes to mind when you think of climate change and global warming? Go ahead and type something in the chat, please. So that um, climate change and global warming, there's an opportunity to change people's minds. Um, I see Armageddon, the possible ending of human society as we know it. We, heard, we actually were just talking about that, that a few minutes ago as a part of the larger group. Um, it's a big job, um, but we can't fail to do it. We don't have much time. I fear for my nieces and nephews who may be seeing the end of our world. Oh my gosh, y'all. Ooh, uh, higher water levels and unstable weather patterns. We have 10 years left, erratic weather patterns, increased storm, fire, loss of property and life, rising water levels, migration, extinction, extreme weather, concern for animals and humans, children's futures, livability, Y'all, this is, yeah, the crisis for our grandchildren that we caused and should own fixing it. Population, um, hunger, poverty, a tipping point. Ooh, thanks everybody for being so present and like feeling that tough space that we're in. I mean, I think, you know, working in the climate space every day, it's really important for me to ground myself in why this matters and, and what I uh, you know, what I think of when I think of climate change and global warming. And one of the, one of the connections I want to make for all of us is that it is really scary and it is really real. And there's a lot of things happening um, all around the world that are seemingly out of our control. That said, um, hopefully my talk will, uh, will enlighten us with some other possibilities. And so this question that I asked you is not is not unique to me. It was actually asked to 14,000 people around the world as part of a globe scan study done by IKEA when they were trying to figure out how they wanted to position their climate messaging, um, which is kind of an interesting, um, interesting story that we could go into another time. So they asked 14,000 people this question and 44% of those 14,000 people mentioned outcomes. They talked about things like changing weather, melting ice caps, 
fires, like you all mentioned, desertification. I, I presented to the Rotary Club in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia this morning at 7.30 my time, a.m., 7.30 p.m. their time, which was incredible. And y'all, what's so interesting to me, because I've asked this question now dozens of times to Rotary Clubs all over the world, is we get the same answers, right? We, and we get, you know, about 44% of people talk about outcomes, about 18% of us talk about the causes of climate change, the burning of fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas. And it never fails, but uh, every time I use this question and the, you know, with the 14,000 people who were asked this by GlobeScan, here's where it gets really interesting. Only 3% of those people said anything about solutions. And that everybody, that's where I want us to sit tonight. I want us to sit in this opportunity space of what we can do as the people lucky enough to be alive on this incredible planet today. And I want the first thing to come to mind when we think about climate change and global warming, I really wanna think about solutions. And with solutions, I want us to think about the opportunity for jobs. And with the opportunity for jobs, I want us to be thinking about co-benefits and all of, and how the world as we know it can actually become better if we stand up and start to put these solutions into action. So my hope is that after this conversation tonight, solutions will be one of the first things that come to mind when you think about climate change. And I know all of you, especially in your district, are doing really incredible climate work that I'm so grateful for. And I hope that this talk will open up some new ideas of solutions that you might put into place. So as um, Deanna mentioned, I work for Project Drawdown and Project Drawdown is the world's leading resource on climate solutions. We were founded in 20, uh, well, we were founded in 2014, uh, in 2017 came out with a book and our latest publication is available for free on our website. Our website is drawdown.org and um, the Drawdown Review is available in English and Spanish and in French. And it really dives into the science behind the solutions. Now you might be wondering, well, what do you do? Do you go out and test the solutions? We have a team of research fellows who scour the peer reviewed literature to understand the landscape of climate solutions that we already have in hand today. And we run them through a number of different models. We run them through financial models. We run them through co-benefit models. We run them through atmospheric models to understand the, um, the potential of reduction or avoidance of heat trapping gases. And that's how we collate all of these solutions. So there's over 80 solutions that we have today. We don't have to wait 10 years in the future. As many of you said, we need to act much more quickly than 10 years in the future. So these are all of the solutions I'm gonna talk about today. We have ready at hand to start putting into place. So I invite you to check out the drawdown review. And I keep saying this word drawdown and you might be wondering what in the world is that weird word? I actually, when I started, I actually asked, can we change our name? Cause like, I just don't get it. Well, actually, let me tell you why we have this name. The name actually comes from a scientific term. And the scientific term uh, indicates the future point in time, this blue dot right here, when the levels of heat trapping gases, those heat trapping greenhouse gases, that's the red squiggly line, when those stop increasing and start to steadily decline, that moment of drawdown is a critical turning point for life on earth. And it's a point that we need to reach as quickly, as safely, and as equitably as possible. You might be wondering, well, how do we get there? How do we actually achieve that blue dot place, the moment of drawdown? And the way that we think about it at Project Drawdown is through a climate equation. So we start this equation in the middle of, you'll see I'll build on on both sides. And in this equation, the gray rectangle uh, represents the atmosphere and it specifically represents all of the heat trapping gases, those greenhouse gases that humans have put into the atmosphere over time. And we'll specifically say per year, okay, just to help us with the, with the math. So these are the, um, the accumulated amount of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere within a year. And they come from these six specific areas. They come about a quarter of those heat trapping gases come from our electricity production, about another quarter from food, agriculture, and land use, 21% from industry, 
oh, I couldn't quite see because I moved my thing, 14% from transportation, 6% from buildings, and 10% from other energy-related emissions. So this, everybody, this is a really helpful part of the story because if we know where those heat trapping gases are coming from, then we can turn off the tap. One, one visual that might be helpful is that if the atmosphere is a bathtub, these are six different faucets that are pouring into that bathtub, right? So what we need to start doing is turning off all of those faucets. Now in our bathtubs, just like in the in our planet, we also have we have sinks, and in the bathtub metaphor, that would be the drain, right? So we've got what we need to do. Uh, with the climate is we need to turn off all of those faucets. We also need to unplug the drain and possibly make the drain bigger and more effective. So um, we want to reduce the sources. We also want to uh, support the sinks of those heat trapping gases. So this is what nature does all by itself. About 40% of those gases in the atmosphere are um, sequestered by the land and by uh, coastal and ocean um, ocean plants, right? This is photosynthesis. This is 10th grade biology where, uh, where we learned about how we breathe out carbon dioxide and plants breathe it in, right? So this is how the carbon is sequestered. So this everybody is our equation for climate action. We do need to remember though that about 60% of those heat trapping gases are left behind. And that's what's creating a thick blanket around the planet. If we go back to our bathtub metaphor, that 60% is what's causing it to start overflowing. So we need to turn off all the taps, all the faucets. We need to clean out the drain so that we don't overflow, right? So that we keep that source and sink um, in balance so that everything is working well. So knowing this equation helps us better set up a framework for climate solutions. And this everybody is uh, the beginning of our framework for climate solutions. So what you'll notice is along the top here, these are the same areas, the same sectors that I just talked about as the sources of those heat trapping gases. So one of the things we need to do is we need to, um, we need to shut off the tap or we need to reduce the sources of heat trapping gases. So that's our first S in our climate solutions framework, sources. Our second S is sinks. We need to support and enhance the sinks of carbon dioxide found in nature. And we need to uh, think about our third S, help society achieve broader transformation. So this everybody all together, these are the three interconnected areas for action that we need to pursue globally, simultaneously and with determination. Sources, sinks and society. So today what I want to do is I want to provide you with an overview of climate solutions that again we have in our hands now today we know they work we know that they're financially feasible we know that they are scalable we can do them and they will help us reach drawdown and they'll help us be begin excuse me to come back into balance with the planet's living systems and these solutions are tools of possibility in the face of a seemingly impossible challenge all of you here tonight are already part of the chorus of people working on climate solutions in so many different ways, but there might be people in your rotary clubs or in your communities who aren't yet part of that chorus. And one way that we might wanna connect with them over climate is really to start with our shared values. So here's one example of shared values that, um, that we have as Rotarians. And this is the four-way test, you know, the Rotarians ethical guidepost, which is, as you all know, a way of knowing how to proceed within our complex world. And so what I'd like to do today, and I, I'm taking a chapter from Kath, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe's book. She's a professor at uh, Texas Tech, and she has an incredible web series called Global Weirding. So if you have any questions about... Um, about climate change that um, might be well answered by at a middle school level. She's just done an incredible job of creating this series of videos. And in one of her videos, she actually mentioned the four-way test. And I was like, oh, I'm going to uh, use this in the Rotarian talk. So thanks to Catherine Hayhoe um, for this. And so let's start out by actually putting climate change through the four-way test. So is climate change the truth? Right, let's start there. And let me unequivocally say, yes, yes it is. We have known since Eunice's, Eunice Foote's work in the 1850s that digging up and burning coal, oil, and natural gas 
produces he those heat trapping gases that are wrapping that extra blanket around the planet. So since then, we've had thousands of studies and millions of data points that have confirmed that this, this hockey stick curve, this keeling curve that we're seeing is absolutely true. We also see that in addition to, uh, or in tandem rather, with carbon dioxide levels and specifically uh, greenhouse gas levels rising, we also see this kind of a temperature increase over time. The climate is changing, humans are responsible, and the impacts are very serious. Now, what does that mean in our world? Well, it means that in the last 50 years, we've seen a lot of changes. Many of you um, might have really taken notice of this over the last 50 years. You know, our global population, our urban population, and our GDP have all increased. And actually, during the last 50 years, um, we've seen more than a doubling of population, um, a five-fold increase in, in the economy, more demand for food, water, and, and fossil fuels than ever before. And that's just in the last 50 years. That's a pretty intense amount of change just in that time period. Now, in the same time period, we also, uh, so we've seen more changes, by the way, in the last 50 years than the entire sum of human history combined. That's pretty sobering when we stop and think about it. We stop and think about how long humans have been here and the last 50 years, we've seen the most change ever. For those of you who want to really geek out with those data, there's some um, a great report from um, the great, it's called the Great Acceleration, where they have all these data, if you want to check that out. Now, in that same time period, you know, not everything was terrible in the last 50 years, and I really want us to focus on that as well, because in the last 50 years, we've gone from a life expectancy globally from 55 to 71 years, we're having smaller families, we're more literate, and we're more urban, mobile, and connected than ever before. We also are much less violent. So in those last 50 years, we've seen a lot of challenges, but we've also seen a lot of opportunity. So while climate change is real, we know that we have the ability to actually stem the tide and really start um, fixing the problems that we've created. So that's the first part of the test. Is it, um, is it true? So yes, it's, uh, is it the truth? Uh, yes, absolutely, it's the truth. Is it fair to all concerned? Is climate change fair? I think you can all probably unequivocally say absolutely not. The poorest and the most vulnerable among us, you know, the people who have done the least to contribute to the problem, they're the most affected. These include women and children, it include, they include farmers who are struggling to raise their crops, coastal residents who are losing their land to sea level rise and erosion, and indigenous people in the Arctic whose traditions are threatened and whose homes are being displaced by rising seas and, and thawing permafrost. We know that climate solutions can advance social and economic equity, but they need to be utilized wisely and well, and we need to pay attention to who decides who benefits and how any drawbacks are mitigated. And it takes intention, it takes courage and care to move climate solutions forward in ways that heal rather than deepen systemic injustices. We have the opportunity and the obligation to co-create new systems that are safe and equitable, ensuring that both people and the planet can thrive together. Going to the third question, will it build goodwill and better friendships? The answer is absolutely. Now, climate change is truly the opportunity of a lifetime, right? And the opportunity of lifetime, when we think about the opportunities to reinvent systems that we now know how to, how to design better. If we think about uh, the, our electrical systems or our um, food, agriculture, and land use systems, those are all systems that humans came up with. And the great news now is that we have more information, more data, as you all were talking about before, that we can actually uh, use to improve those systems and make them better for everyone. We know that working together to put climate solutions into place in our communities can build goodwill and create better friendships, protecting our neighbors from the greatest impacts of climate change. And the last question on the four-way test is, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Again, unequivocally, yes. Because beyond just addressing heat trapping gases, these climate solutions have what we call co-benefits that contribute to a better, more equitable world. Climate solutions are not just climate solutions. This solution here that you're seeing uh, with a clean cook stove, 
is also an is also a health solution because we're decreasing indoor air pollution. Climate solutions that protect and restore ecosystems are also biodiversity solutions. Many climate solutions can create jobs, foster resilience to climate impacts like storms and droughts, and really bring other environmental benefits like safeguarding our precious water resources. So let's check and see how we did. Does climate change pass the four-way test? If we apply the four-way test, is it the truth? Yes. Is it fair to all concerned? No. And we need to make sure that all the solutions, as we implement solutions, that it is fair to all concerned by centering on equity. Will it build goodwill and better, fr better friendships? Absolutely. And will it be beneficial to all concerned? Yes. Again, if we center on equity. So how might this kind of framing be useful as you reach out within your communities, especially with that, within um, your Rotary community to really get more people into the chorus working on climate solutions. By beginning with values and the values that we hold dear, by showing respect for those shared values and then connecting the dots between what we already care about and the changing climate, we can absolutely have productive conversations about these climate solutions in our communities. So one question I wanna ask all of you is, you know, what can you do? We know that widespread awareness and understanding of climate solutions is really vital to kindle agency and affect change worldwide. And our world, our society, future generations need all of us to be part of the solution. So how do you do that? Well, that's up to you. I heard some great stories at the beginning of uh, the beginning of this meeting about how how all of you are stepping up in different ways and this is an image of youth at a climate rally that might not be your style and that's okay there's all sorts of ways we can plug in all sorts of different solutions that we need to be part of this mosaic of this climate climate solution movement and one of the most impactful things we can all do is to actually just start talking about climate i know many of you on this call do a great job of sharing um sharing uh information about climate with your Rotary Clubs and with your families and your communities and beyond. Thank you so much for doing that. You are taking a great step on your climate journey. And all of you here today who are learning more about climate solutions, thanks for being willing to, to learn about how you might uh, be stepping into the space as well. So I encourage you to learn about um, what, you're, what, you're, um, what you know about climate solutions with your community. One aspect of community involvement also involves youth. And unfortunately, in many places, youth don't get to learn about uh, the ways that their careers can intersect with climate solutions. And another role that I'd like to invite all of us into tonight is thinking about inviting youth and, and anyone in our world who, uh, who works in a career to think of their career as centering on climate. And when I say that, I don't mean that we need everyone to become a climate scientist. I don't mean that we need everyone to become a solar installer, but what about an accountant, right? If someone wants to be an accountant, what if they become an accountant for some for a, a nonprofit focused on climate solutions, right? Instead of working for the big five or something like that. And so really encouraging uh, the people in our lives to make their careers centered on climate and climate solutions. Now, we've taken a step in this journey at, um, at Project Drawdown, working with a group out of Minneapolis called Climate Generation. And Climate Generation did an incredible job creating a, uh, a documentary about these uh, eight people you see on the screen here. They, they, are, uh, they focus on green STEM careers, and we aligned them with different project drawdown solutions, and I'll share a little bit with you, uh, with you tonight on that. So what I want us to think about is to consider supporting people in integrating climate solutions into their careers. So those of you who might have middle or high school youth in your lives, Climate Generation also created a documentary and an instructional supplement for educators to use with their students. So I'll share some of those career paths with you um, as we go on tonight. So today what I want to do is I want to share stories of climate solutions that when we put them into place, they help us move towards drawdown and they help people and communities that we care about. So we're going to start first with the electricity sector. What you're seeing here is again the aggregation of the data that we analyze. And when we think about the electricity sector, we find solutions 
falling into two major categories. Those two categories of solutions are shifting production. We want to shift the production of electricity away from burning of those fossil fuels and towards more renewables and enhancing efficiency. We want to be as efficient as possible. The other area that we haven't quantified but is really important in all of this is improving the system. So we want to shift production, enhance efficiency, and improve the system. When we think about um, those those different categories, there are loads of solutions that fall within them. And that's what you're seeing in these, um, these bubble diagrams. Uh, the size of the bubble corresponds to the two different scenarios we look at in the drawdown review. One of the scenarios is for staying under 1.5 degrees Celsius. The other is for staying underneath two degrees Celsius. These are all global numbers. All of our analyses are at the global level. Uh, so, you know, that's, um, you know, an average of, a global mean temperature. So, so the um, that's what you're seeing with the the different colors, and all of these are scaled um, in terms of the the possible uh, excuse me the um, the avoidance potential for those heat trapping gases. So the smaller the circle, the less potential for avoid or they would avoid fewer of those heat trapping gases, the larger the circle, you could avoid more. Now, what I really wanna emphasize here is that um, in the 2017 book, we had rankings and we actually still have the rankings in the drawdown review. And people got really excited about, oh my gosh, the number one solution is blah, 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 right? And what we found out is that when people didn't feel connected to the top solution, then they kind of turned off. So what I really want us to think about is that I want us to look at this as a mosaic of solutions and we need all of the pieces put into place for us to get to drawdown as quickly, safely and equitably as possible. Some of these might make a whole lot of sense in your community, others might not. So this is really a choose your own adventure kind of space where you can figure out which pieces of the mosaic uh, work best for you. So you're going to see these kinds of diagrams uh, for each of the solution sectors, which is why I wanted to spend a little bit of time explaining that right now. So, um, you know, today I want to consider a little bit about the, the solutions and, and these look great on paper and they are kind of motivating, but at the end of the day, they're just words, right? When I look at ocean power or onshore wind turbines or um, offshore wind turbines, unless there are people behind these solutions actually putting them into place, nothing's going to change. And that's the thing that's getting me really excited at Project Drawdown because we're really thinking a lot about career and technical education and how we can support this transformation that we're also seeing coming out of the federal government where we really need climate ready careers. And so I want to tell you about some of those folks and I also want to tell you about some projects that Rotary International has underway in these spaces. So the first person I want to introduce you to is Jamez Staples. And Jamez is the CEO of Renewable Energy Partners in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Jamez could have been a CEO of any kind of company, but he decided that he wanted to do good while addressing poverty and climate change at the same time, that co-benefit. So he works on climate solutions by developing community solar projects. So he places those community solar projects in high density urban areas, he provides solar subscriptions for low-income households. He supports minority and women-owned businesses, and he partners with community-based groups on ongoing operations. So Renewable Energy Partners, Jamez's company, depends on solar installers like Kevin Brown to put those climate solutions into place in communities. And actually, solar installers and wind turbine service technicians are two of the fastest growing jobs in the US right now. Talk about an incredible opportunity for people who wanna really launch into a climate ready career. Now, here's another example of someone who didn't think he wanted to get into a climate ready career, but that's where he is now. This is Nathan Thomas. Some of you might've read about him in a recent issue of uh, The Rotarian. In high school in, in uh, Ohio, Nathan loved computers and he really loved refurbishing them. And he had an idea that he would refurbish them and then he would send them to emerging economies where they could maybe use the computers. Well, when he was 18, he had the chance to visit Uganda. And when he visited Uganda, he realized that there were actually more immediate concerns than refurbished computers. Because in Uganda, access to power is expensive. It's dirty and it's inconsistent if, if it's available at all. 
There's frequent blackouts that interrupt learning. Health centers are unable to keep vaccines on hand, which we know especially today is extremely, extremely challenging. And students with no access to power can't study after the sun sets. So enter all we are. After studying mechanical engineering and at the University of Cincinnati, Nathan founded All We Are, which is a nonprofit bringing sustainable energy solutions to communities in Uganda. Not only is this a climate solution because we're shifting production to renewables, but the solution has incredible co-benefits. It decreases energy costs by up to 80%. It improves student performance and helps communities thrive. And in the past five years, the Solarize Uganda Now project has completed 32 solar installations at 26 schools, two medical clinics, and a women's shelter, and they've installed three solar panel wells. Now, Nathan couldn't do this alone, and this is where Rot uh, Rotary is so, so incredible, and y'all are just amazing people of action. He worked in partnership with the Raleigh Midtown Club, the Rotary Club of Cincinnati, the Rotary Club of Kampala, District 7710, 9211, and 67, uh, 6670. If any of you are interested in learning about Nathan's journey or possibly even working with him on All We Are, um, here's his email address and he is super happy to have anyone reach out to him. Moving from electricity onto food, agriculture, and land use, the solutions in this sector focus on three main areas, focusing on addressing food waste and diets, on shifting agricultural practices and on protecting ecosystems. And what I wanna talk about tonight is food waste. And sadly, a third, one third of the world's food is never eaten, which means that all of the land, all of the resources used and the heat trapping gases that were emitted in producing that food were completely unnecessary, not to mention the labor and the time and all of the things that go into making the food that should end up in our stomachs. But food waste is a solvable problem. And it's a problem that Natalie Jacobson is solving as a campus kitchen coordinator. So Natalie recovers extra fruits and vegetables from local farmers markets, and she donates that food to people in the community who don't have easy access to fresh fruits and vegetables. She works on reducing food waste and on reducing hunger. This is a kind of a job that I would have never known existed um, when I was in college. And uh, it's such a critical, it's one of those intersectional jobs that you, we don't necessarily learn about on any career, career test that we might take in high school, but it's really part of that fabric of reinventing our systems to make sure that we are centering on equity, that we are also centering on climate solutions in, you know, in our community. So campus kitchen coordinator, I'm really grateful for people like Natalie who are doing what they're doing. Now with Rotary, there's a lot of interest in focusing on food. And let me tell you a little bit about what's going on with, um, with SREG. And I should mention that the Environmental Sustainability Rotary Action Group, which I think many of you are familiar with, many of you are members of it. Um, that's an organization um, you can join for a small fee. And there's really incredible work happening um, from that, that um, Rotary Action Group focused on climate solutions. And here are some of the things that um, that folks are working on. Now, this is a hierarchy and it's based on the United Nations food waste recovery hierarchy. And what this hierarchy means is that we want to stay as close to the top as possible and we want to, we do not want to get to the bottom. So when we think about food waste, what should we do with it? We want to try to stay at the top. And th this was all mapped out by Rob Anderson of Melbourne, Australia. He realized that there were already a lot of Rotarians who were working on projects and he wanted to map them out. So I'm going to share with you some of the work that Rob did. He realized that, you know, the, the most important thing we should do is just reduce the sources of that food waste. So we can do that through education and awareness programs. The next thing, the next level down is if there is waste in the first place, we want to make sure we feed hungry people. So let's figure out how to do that in our communities. If we absolutely can't feed hungry people with that food, then let's feed it to animals, right? Because it's food, let's eat it as food. If we can't feed animals, then let's figure out how to use it in an industrial way. Things like, um, you know, biofuels, bioplastics, insect processing. 
if we can't do that, then let's compost it, right? That's what, so often we jump to compost as, you know, it's kind of a savior, like, oh, it's okay, I composted it, but it's still, composting is really far down the food waste recovery hierarchy. We want to try, if it's food, let's use it as food and only compost it if it's something that we really wouldn't eat, like a banana peel or coffee grounds or things like that. And the last thing we want to do and we want to avoid as much as possible is focusing on the landfill and incineration. And here's a great example that some of you might have heard about before, um, a partnership um, called Lunch Out of Landfills. And Joe Richardson is in Frederick County, Maryland. He read um, about some of the Project Drawdown work and specifically focused on food waste. And he's like, that's a solvable problem. Let's do something about that at our local school district. Now, he's been still working on things, even in the midst of COVID-19, when the students aren't in school, laying the groundwork to really ramp up his Lunch Out of Landfills program. So let me tell you a little bit about it. He started by getting a bunch of youth involved, as well as, of course, um, his local rotary clubs, a composting working group, a composting, a local composting company, and school officials to really uh, sort out food initially to say, oh my gosh, what are we, what's going on here? So they sorted out um, food waste, liquids and recyclables. And then they worked, they weighed it, they measured their impact and they started working with a local uh, composter offsite to come and pick it up from the school so that it was staying out of the landfill. Now they're doing lots of things upstream to get the youth to eat more of their food, especially the health, the eat, eat their healthy food. And then the stuff that isn't being eaten, they're composting. Now, this is not something that you need to create from scratch. Joe and his team have created a lunch out of landfills toolkit so that we know kind of right away how to get started. Now, those of you who are interested in getting to know more about the food related work uh, in um, uh, within Rotary, Rob Anderson is your guy. Rob would be happy to uh, connect with you and connect you with any of the opportunities that he knows going on. Rob is also one of the co-chairs of SREG. So feel free to reach out to Rob if you're interested. Industry uh, might seem like something that only large multinational companies can work on, but it's actually not the case. In the industry sector, there are solutions related to how we use waste, like composting and, and industrial recycling, as well as addressing refrigerants that live in old refrigerators and air conditioners. And um, some of you might be might be um, aware of some of the Freon work happening at SREG, and I'll talk about that just in a second. But why do we care about air conditioners and refrigerators? Well. They're amazing machines in that they keep either our spaces or our food really cold. And they do that through these molecules. One of the trademark names is Freon, they're CFCs or HCFCs. And those molecules have been created to be incredible heat trapping gases, right? So they trap heat really well. Now, unfortunately, during use and disposal, those refrigerants, if they're released into the atmosphere, they keep doing their job and they keep trapping heat and they are much, much better at it than carbon dioxide. And so we don't want them in our atmosphere because they are trapping heat and uh, we don't need that blanket to get any thicker. So um, here's where a career connection is super interesting. And I'd like you to meet Elise Sorensen. Elise is a chemist at Train Technologies where she works to understand the interactions of refrigerants with different materials that train uses to build their materials. She also works on coming up with natural refrigerants so that we don't have to use CFCs and HCFCs. So her job is a climate solution just by evaluating and identifying sustainable refrigerants that we can use in our, prod in our products. Now, um, refrigerants are all over the world. This is an image of a lot of refrigerants that were found in Ghana and a group called Trade Water decided to work with them and Intuit. Intuit actually paid for the carbon offsets that Trade Water was selling from disposing of these refrigerants. So y'all were talking a bit about carbon offsets before. There's all sorts of ways that money can flow into offsetting um, different emissions. This is one example of a way that, um, that capital can flow into reducing the emissions of refrigerants. So Trade Water takes that money, they use it to collect the refrigerants from Ghana, and then they neutralize them in a special kiln they have in Chicago. And then uh, we don't have those heat trapping gases, which is incredible. So um, here's another example of just how many um, unused canisters of refrigerants they had just hanging out in a back shed in Accra, Ghana. And because of the sale, 
trade water could uh, work with city waste recycling, sweep up all these refrigerants. They've since moved down to Costa Rica and y'all, they are now working with Rotary International, specifically Clary, who probably many, many of you know, and she is working on an SREG project leading um, with the ultimate goal of creating and selling um, CFC destruction credits of to 1 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. The hope is that um, if, if she's able to collect enough and, able, and trade water is able to sell it, then a whole bunch more money can, can flow, flow into um, Rotary International and be used for global grants. So uh, thanks, huge gratitude to Clary for stepping up and really seeing how to leverage uh, Rotary's network to put this solution into place. So hopefully some of these are things that you might not have thought about before, but you can be grateful that, you know, people within Rotary are really leveraging this incredible network. When we think about transportation, we want to focus on shifting to alternatives of fossil fuel burning transportation. We want to enhance efficiency and electrify, ve electrify vehicles, but it's not enough just to say, buy an electric car, especially in a place like Sitka, Alaska, an island with 8,500 people where I live, where um, we only have one electric car technician. So we're working on uh, training more of our automotive technicians to be able to be like Jukka Kokonen, right? He's an electric vehicle consultant, and he's really willing to work in a space that's rapidly changing. And so when we think about the solutions we want to put into place, we need to expand out into the systems that need to support these solutions, right? So just having an electric car, if you don't have anyone to work on it, even though thankfully the maintenance is very, very low on electric vehicles, um, we still need to be thinking about what kinds of careers in our communities are going to help these solutions be really successful. Now, I don't have a great rotary example of transportation. Maybe you all can work on this in your district, but a fun example is um, some of the work happening with bike sharing programs around the country. This happens to be in Detroit, and this particular bike share, uh, bike share program is focused on accessibility. And so people, it has a uh, one specific drop off and pickup point where people can leave their wheelchairs or mobility devices and there's a person there to watch all of their things and then they're able to rent the bikes and they might just want to try one out for a day um, and and this when we think about including everyone in climate solutions i think this is just a great example of not assuming that everyone wants to ride it everyone wants to nor can ride a two-wheel bike so really focusing on accessibility the last part of our S's of reducing sources focuses on buildings. And um, we want to focus on enhancing efficiency and shifting energy sources, as well as addressing those refrigerants. And that's where someone like Katie Reamer comes in. Katie is um, a renewable energy specialist, and she improves energy efficiency in buildings. There are so many careers out there that make our homes and schools and community buildings more energy efficient. And these careers are incredibly diverse and they're found all across the country and all across the world. Things like from construction to manufacturing and changing the way we use energy in our homes. There's so much potential, so many opportunities in the building space. One solution that Rotary Clubs have put into place is specifically focused on building clean cook stoves. It's a powerful action that's not only a climate solution, but it's also a human health solution and a solution that improves society. Through a partnership with the Cook Stove Project, the Yonkers, East Yonkers Rotary Club in the US and the Lugazi community in Uganda, a hundred clean cook stoves were built to create a safe smoke and heat trapping gas free environment. And this initiative is benefiting more than 800 residents and these stoves replace open fires that kill 4.3 million people each year through dangerous indoor air pollution. That's crazy everybody, like no one should die from indoor air pollution. For $1,000, an entire community is saved from the unseen danger by equipping the homes with clean cook stoves. Each stove is handmade using local materials and it uses far less fuel and causes much, much less damage to the environment and to human health. So that's, those are some ways that we can reduce sources. When we think about supporting sinks, this is a little overwhelming. There's a lot of opportunity here when we think about what we can do on land. What we can do on land is we can focus on shifting our agricultural practices, protecting and restoring ecosystems, using degraded land and addressing food waste and diets comes back in as well. 
we need more people like Dr. Ukaga. Dr. Ukaga is a leader in agricultural extension programs. So those of you who might be familiar with land grant universities all over the US, those land grant universities and many, many others have extension programs where they take the learnings from the ivory tower and they actually work with practitioners in the field. They work with the farmers, they worked with, with the land managers to really implement the solutions and the cutting edge research in order to get those solutions from peer reviewed papers into the in, into the world and, and on the ground. And the, kind, the kinds of partnerships that Dr. Ukaga creates really are the kinds of shifts that we need to see because things like um, improving our land and improving the sinks in our land are, they really require multi-region climate friendly food systems. That's what I love so much about Rotary that especially with SREG, we have people all over the world who are thinking about ways to put solutions into place and connect them um, across continents. So thanks for all of your great work in that space. A Rotary example is the Rotary Club of Rose Bell. It's an island uh, on the island of Mauritius. They launched the One Million Trees Project as a community-wide effort to plant a million trees in Mauritius before the, uh, before the year 20, uh, 2030. They want every person who lives on the island to plant at least one tree. And they're really hoping that the trees promote ecotourism, that they fight deforestation, and that they create sustainable business opportunities. So while I encourage all of us to use the incredible natural power of trees as land sinks of heat trapping gases, it's important to know where, when, and what to plant. It's, it's important to know that the trees we're planting are the right trees for the right place. And there are some great resources on the SREG website and many, many other places um, for us to look to. Uh, the Crowther Institute is actually one of the best places. That's uh, who Google is working with for their, uh, their global tree program uh, also. If you're interested in knowing a little bit more about regenerative agriculture, that's kind of a buzzy phrase that we hear a lot these days. We actually uh, decided to write a primer about regenerative agriculture and kind of some of the myths and some of the, the things that are scientifically sound. And that can be found for free on our website also. So if you go to our homepage, you can download Farming Our Way Out of the Climate Crisis. There are um, there's lots and lots of opportunities with land sinks. Unfortunately, some of the promises have been really overblown and not based in science. So as we move forward, you know, we already know what works. Like, let's get that into the hands of people and actually start putting it into place. When we think about coastal and ocean sinks, um, this looks kind of sad right now. There's actually a lot more solutions. We have a number of research fellows working on this right now. So um, right now, we just really talk about coastal and wetland restoration as well as protection. And the career that I want to focus on here is actually what Anna Vang does. Anna is a policy associate at the St. Paul Mayor's Office. So her role, most of these climate solutions have policy implications, as we know. And, um, you know, we could get into a very interesting discussion about whether or not actions at the local level matter or if we need federal or state policy. And I would have an answer for you, which is all of it matters. We need to pull all of those levels at all levels of agency. And especially in the environmental field and focused on climate, things are moving so quickly that people like Anna are so critical to informing policymakers about what's happening out in the world. So as part of her job, she reads and summarizes information for the mayor so that policymakers are informed about the latest research related to climate. A Rotary example is actually the Rotaract Club in New Kingston, Jamaica, where they planted 50 ma mangrove trees. And they know that protecting ecosystems like mangroves, salt marshes, and seagrass meadows supports ongoing photosynthesis and carbon storage. And mangroves have the co-benefit also of protecting communities from the impacts of intense storms. So we've talked about reducing sources, we've talked about supporting sinks, and we're on the last S, everybody, which is supporting society. And we know that climate and social systems are profoundly connected. And those connections open up solutions that are often overlooked. Some initiatives that are designed primarily to ensure rights and foster equality also have cascading benefits to climate change. Those types of benefits include high quality access to voluntary reproductive health care and high quality inclusive education, which are fundamental human rights and cornerstones of gender equality. In more indirect ways, making strides in health and education can also benefit the climate. 
you all might be interested in doing some education work within your district. And I encourage you to check out the Drawdown Eco Challenge. They're a great partner of ours where they look at all of the drawdown solutions and they come up with different individual and community level solutions that we can put into place uh, in, our, in our homes and communities. They help you track your progress. You can create teams, all while really taking those climate solutions off the page and into your community. Another great resource I'd love to share with you is Change X. Change X is, um, is it chock full of inspiration for community level projects. I highly recommend checking out their website and um, thinking about how you might put some of these projects into place in your own community because we all have a role to play in implementing climate solutions. And if we do all of these things, if we reduce the sources by implementing solutions that are focused on electricity, food, agriculture, and land use, industry, transportation, and buildings, if we support sinks on land and in the ocean, and if we improve society through healthcare and education, we can actually reach drawdown. And I've shared some climate solution stories with you today, as well as a number of different, uh, different career paths that we might be thinking about as we really lean into this great transformation. So what's next? Well, I'll tell you a little bit about what's next at Project Drawdown, and then I want you to think about what's next for you. In the coming weeks, it's taken a little longer than we hoped, but they'll be out soon. We are going to have a whole series of videos called Climate Solutions 101, where we'll be talking about the science behind climate solutions. And we have interviews with these 10 incredible experts in various, um, various climate related fields, everything from climate policy to transboundary air pollution to deforestation in Brazil. So please stay tuned for that. If you're interested, I encourage you to sign up for our newsletter on drawdown.org. And as soon as they launch, I promise to send you an email. Um, they're just not there yet. <laughs> we also are doing more work, as I mentioned, on climate ready careers. And we're thinking a lot about accelerators. We know that we need, um, we can't do, we can't put these solutions into place on our own. And we're thinking a lot about the accelerators needed to get those solutions off the page and into the communities. How are we going to change laws, regulations, taxes, and incentives? How are we going to shift capital? How are we going to renew goals and standards? And we have a new initiative called Drawdown Labs that's looking specifically at that. How are we going to focus innovation and research and development on other solutions that we don't yet have in hand, at hand? And how are we going to shift norms and culture? We also have a new initiative called Drawdown Lift that's looking at the intersection of climate solutions and poverty alleviation. And I'm so excited for that work to really get off the ground. So with that, I'm curious about where your thinking is right now. At the beginning of the talk, I asked you what comes to mind when you think about climate change and global warming. I'd love to invite you back to the chat for you to write about what's coming to mind now. Thank you so much for adding some things, hope and solutions, rotary focus, collaborative projects. Um, people can't wait to start working on some of the solutions. So much opportunity. We know how to do it. We just need the motivation. We need um, support to the younger generation, which is so, so important. Um, how to make the accelerators happen. Absolutely. And we can all make a difference in our future. I mean, one of the things that grounds me and I have two young sons and um, I think about, you know, no one else on this, no one else in the history of humankind has been alive at this moment and has been in this incredible position to write the next chapter of life on earth. We are the authors and we get to make it amazing, but we have to have the motivation to do it. And so that's where I think we can all really step up and start to think about how we put these solutions into place in the most safe, equitable, and fast uh, way possible. So what I want to remind us is that we have so many tools of possibility. There are diverse intervention points from the individual all the way up to the, the multinational scales. And it takes a whole ecosystem of activities and actors to create and accelerate the transformation that's required. And as we look back at the four-way test, 
let's remember that we can use our shared values to connect with people, especially other Rotarians, in order to, in order to engage our community in climate solutions. For those of you who are interested in getting involved in SREG, they do have a website, it's sreg.org. Um, you can also contact Rob Anderson and Doug White, who are the collaborative leads um, on SREG if you wanna learn more. And I encourage you to, to reach out to them. And I encourage you to think about what you wanna reach towards. This is an image of some of the incredible um, trees that we have here in Sitka, Alaska. And the reality of intervening in this kind of a complex system is that no one person can do it all. And we all have an opening to show up as problem solvers and as change agents and contribute in significant ways, even when we feel small. Society has a choice to make about what shape this transformation will take. Will we employ the collective courage and determination and diversity of the existing solutions to move the world towards a balance with the planet's living systems? Will we pursue climate action in ways that heal systemic injustices, foster resilience, well-being, and equality? Who do we want to be at this pivotal moment in human history? Because together we can leverage the solutions that we have today to build a bridge from where we are now to the world that we want for ourselves, for all life, and most importantly, for generations yet to come. A better path is absolutely still possible and may we turn that possibility into reality. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bagley. That was amazing and brilliant and so uplifting. Um, I'm going to hand it over to um, Rod Deardon, who um, he's graced us with giving us a little bit of his hour and um, Rod, and I want to just hand over the, the rest of the meeting to you. Uh, Deanna, thank you very much. And congratulations on chairing a fine San Jose uh, Rotary Climate Action Committee meeting and, and for expanding your, your program in San Jose so, so uh, wonderfully. Uh, we're doing the same thing, uh, Elizabeth, in District 5170 and beyond. We have folks that are, are working with us now from as far away as Mount Shasta way up in Northern California, not as far north as you are, but uh, they're, they're having some snow too. And as far south as, uh, as uh, uh, past uh, Texas. Uh, and, and we're really having a good time uh, communicating with them. I just sent you a note on chat asking how we can efficiently promote your presentation. We, we do have a lot of requests for presentations and our presentation focuses on the problem because there's a lot of people that still don't believe it's happening. And uh, you, you got a couple of chats uh, from folks uh, that are concerned about the situation but are, are still being confronted by the climate, climate deniers. And uh, I, I think they're on the way out but we still need to fight them from time to time uh, and have the right answers to questions without being uh, combative uh, in uh, Rotary meetings and in the community. Uh, we're making presentations to Rotary clubs all over the Western United States now, and uh, although focusing in the Bay Area, and we're um, and we're uh, uh, also communicating in our community to um, you know everything from home and school clubs, to Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, and and uh, and and so on and so on. So. Uh, uh, as we make those presentations and people ask us, uh, what can we do? That's a perfect lead in to your presentation, which is primarily solution oriented. And, and uh, we'd love to be able to uh, develop that synergy. Uh, I don't know whether you're still able to communicate, but if you are. I am, but I was just multitasking and popping too many things in the chat. I'm sorry, Rod, for the slowness. So um, okay. first of all, Thanks everybody for taking this time to think about climate solutions. The first thing I just popped in, well, I popped in the drawdown um, website for those of you who want to download the drawdown review. I also love this video. I put the link in the chat. It's from the Alliance for Climate Education, which is actually a youth focused group. And this lovely video talks about how to talk about climate. So Rod, to your point and many others in the chat, 
you know, there are still people who um, don't believe in climate, who are climate deniers. Now, the second link, and actually, let me get you an even better one, it looks at um, the work from uh, the Yale program on climate communication. And they've looked at um, what they call um, Yale's Six Americas. And actually, so, and I won't, I won't pull it up right now, but basically um, less than 7% of the US population um, is called, would be called climate deniers. They just happen to be really loud. And unfortunately they get way more airtime than they deserve. So at Project Drawdown, what we actually focus on are the 93% of the rest of the country who care about in some way climate action. And what's really interesting, if you look at, um, let me see if I'm, if I have the right one for you. Um, there's an incredible work uh, focused on the change over time. Here it is, the old six Americas, I will send it your way. There's incredible work on how that's changed over the last 10 years. And the category of deniers has shrunk and the category of people at the other end, the people who are alarmed has increased. And it's really, really heartening to see that. Now that said, it still can be really intimidating. My aunt Deb, we are recording this, she probably won't watch it, but my aunt Deb is real tricky, right? And so what I have to do, if I have any of these conversations about her, you know, she loves me as, as her niece and we have to center, we center on values and on, she has grandchildren. And so we, we find those shared values. I also have to stop talking and I have to listen. And I have to hear about what she cares about and really connect on those terms rather than on me. We know unequivocally that throwing facts and science at people just makes them build walls because they just get nervous and defensive. And so let's not do that. Elizabeth, don't stop talking. <laughs> we, you're, our, you're our best weapon and, and uh, we hope that you'll continue to to fight the battle. But the, the, the issue that we have is that Rotary was traditionally a pretty conservative organization. And, and in the uh, recent years, it's become more progressive and more knowledgeable. But in almost every Rotary pr presentation, and I've made hundreds of them, there's one or two or 7%, although it's probably a little more than that with Rotary, uh, get up and one, they get up and walk out. Uh, th those that's that's the sad part or they'll they'll uh, wait until the some, some of them wait until the end most of them some of them will interrupt you and and just tell you you're full of bull manure and uh, and that uh, it isn't happening and so on and at that point you need to have the facts and our, our material has the facts and and that's what uh, we get through in a, in a very short time 15 minutes 20 minutes is is our powerpoint now yours yours takes a little longer, uh, but it it uh, it is a good follow on. To see most rotary presentations are fifteen minutes, twenty minutes of presentation, and then maybe five or ten minutes of Q and A. So there's a there's a synergy between the two there. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely, sure. Red. I hear you. Just to speak to that, so the the presentation I gave to the Adi Sababa. Uh, Rotary Club today was was under 20 minutes. I expanded a lot for you all, just partly because I know that you all are um, at the much, um, you know, you're at, at one end of the spectrum of climate, climate knowledge. Um, and so one of the things that we're doing right now, and it's taken us a little longer, so my apologies, because we need to get this moving, is we actually have a, a new communications team at Project Drawdown, and they are just incredible. So we're working on an ambassador kit right now. We can have, um, especially a lot of the slides that I shared at the beginning about, you know, what is drawdown? How does, what is this framework that you all could present, you know, in your voice to your, as trusted messengers within your communities. And so those will be available in the coming months. We also have that whole series of climate solutions videos that will be freely available and we would love for you to use them as much as possible. And so um, that's something that we're hoping that will be really helpful um, soon. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, thank you. Uh, that's the kind of a thing that we'll need. And if you wouldn't mind uh, sending maybe a catalog or a, a, a listing of the ones that you think we could use most effectively, can't use them all, uh, but the ones we could use, use most effectively, send them to Yavuz uh, Attila, who is the ESRAG uh, director for the Western United States, 
and to me, and we'll get them out to this area so that they can communicate with you and get you to speak. Great. Thank you so much, Rod. Glad, glad to do it. And you've, you've earned the support and it, you, you give uh, this old grandpa a little hope for my grandbabies. That's the, that's the best thing I could hope for. Thank you, you Rod. And thanks so much, everybody. You bet. Thank you. Now, we're going to